Bible, a book that contains stories of nine-foot giants, families who live to be a thousand years old, food that falls from heaven, and epic wars. Cities turn to ash from the rage of tyrants, kings cast down, men dying in the dust of battle. One of the most controversial books in history, some people claim it even holds the answers to life and death. The Bible was written by 40 different authors, representing a diverse group of people. They range from a doctor, a few shepherds, farmers, fishermen, tax collectors, and kings. With over 6 billion copies in print, the Bible is actually a compilation of 66 books written over 1,600 years. This makes it one of the oldest books in existence. It's also one of the most documented books ever. There are over 10,000 ancient manuscripts supporting its accuracy and consistency with original writings. Parts of the Bible, like Proverbs, read like self-help. It is better to live alone in the desert than with a crabby, complaining wife. There are rules to live by, too, like don't murder people. Four books of the Bible are biographical accounts of Jesus, called the Gospels. And then there are historical books about people like Moses, Noah, and occasionally bears. Then two bears came out of the woods and mauled 43 of the youths. Right now, copies are being smuggled across borders. It's sitting in the pocket of a pastor being arrested. It's being read in jail cells and on deathbeds. It was tucked in the hold of the Mayflower. Without a doubt, it's a provocative and controversial book. Love it or hate it, believe it or don't. But decide for yourself, as the number one best-selling book in history, it just might be worth the read. Would you do that? Grab your Bible right now, and we're going to dive into this new series, just a three-week kind of series. We walk through the book of Genesis, or some of it, and to get us on track as we walk through what we're calling the year of the Bible. Uh, but I want to say, I want to start up front, uh, we have a problem with the Bible. Can I say that in church? Uh, we have a problem with the Bible. How many of you, um, we own, everybody owns a Bible, right? How many of you have a Bible? Have a Bible. If you don't have a Bible, come find me afterwards. Uh, next steps will be right over here out of these doors, and we'll give you a Bible, for real. Uh, how many of you have more than one Bible? Just raise your hand high if you've got more than one. How many of you, like me, you've got like, like multiple Bibles? Okay. In my office, I don't know how many Bibles I have. I, I've got, I bet I have 20 Bibles. I mean, different translations, whatever else. And, and, and you know, then you go online, right? And now you can find everything you want on version or wherever else. Uh, you can go and find all kinds of stuff about the Bible. If you're like me, uh, how many of you, I'm curious, not all of us did, but how many of you grew up in church? You grew up in a church, like from the time you were little. I was in church nine months before I was born. And, uh, and I was one of those who received, back in the day, I got the little baby Bible. Anybody get a baby Bible when you were little? I had people give me a Bible. I had adults give me a Bible as a child. Uh, and I received that Bible, and I believed, they told me it was true, this is God's Word, is true, and I believed it was true. I hadn't read it, I just believed it was true. And, and, and so then, you know, a lot of us, the way that we approach the Bible nowadays is, is kind of like this. You know, we, we look on, on social media, for instance. We look on Instagram, and we see somebody did a calligraphy of a verse. That's a great verse. Um, probably the one verse that's taken out of context more than any verse. In, I can do all things. No, you can't. Not really. I'm going to make the basketball team. Uh, may, you might not. You're not very good. Um, no, I can do all things. You know, so we, we look at, we pull verses out, or it might be like this. Like, I, in fact, I posted this one. Okay, That's an awesome verse. Just want to encourage people, put it out there on Instagram. But it's, it's taken out of context as well. Not to say it's not powerful, okay? Keep pressing on. We've got other, other possibilities. This girl's killing it in her quiet time. I mean, she's going next level. She's got post-it notes, and she's got the coffee going on as well. Incredible. We got another gal who, I think it's a gal, because she wrote in the, in the side of her book. That, now, I'm looking at this. I'm going, that's legit. That's amazing. It's out of Galatia. She got the Halo Top ice cream. That is, I mean... I'm, diver I'm like, I'm, man, I can't focus. I mean, I'm on to the ice cream, right? Or maybe, we got one more, do we? Yes, okay. So this is a great verse as well, Micah 6, 8, uh, part of it. My point is this. This is how we engage the scriptures nowadays. Or maybe you, you know, you, you, read, you get a devotional from somebody. Maybe you get an email and they have a verse on it and that person talks about the verse. Maybe you do read a devotional. That's all good. It's got a verse or two and some other person's description and how the, the verse spoke to them. Now they're going to tell you. And what we end up with is a secondhand faith, a hand-me-down faith. Not all of that's bad. 
I mean, you're here today. You're going to hear me talk about Scripture. I'm going to get underneath it. We're going to understand the context. All that's important. But we have a problem with the Bible. Here's our problem. We don't read the Bible. And as believers, if we claim that we base our faith on the authority of God's Word, and it's all that we need for life and practice to follow Jesus every day, we've got a problem because we don't read the Bible. And that sounds crazy to people who understand that isn't the Bible central to your faith, you Christian people? And I want us to be really honest. I'm not here to shame anybody. I'm just challenging all of us. Many of you, in fact, how many of you are reading through the Bible this, this year with us? Year of the Bible. Okay. You can still join us, all right? This is an incredible journey. Uh, the, the Read Scripture app has been awesome with helpful videos and such that help us understand the context and what the book's all about as we dive into it. But here's what's going on in our culture today. Our young people are, are that generation, and it happens with each one. In this generation now, Pew Research has done a uh, big study of, across the board, and then other researchers have done this as well. And the fastest growing group, when you talk about religious belief in America, the fastest growing group is called the nuns. Some of you heard this, not like nuns out of the church, Catholic church nuns, N-O-N-E-S nuns. Those who would say when asked about their religious affiliation or belief, they say none. It's now at 25% in America, highest it's ever been, up from just 16% in 2007. That's a leap. There's a lot of people you know, trying to interpret all that as to why that is the case. Part of it is that no longer do you need to be a cultural Christian in our, in our society, where people maybe had the halo effect previously, and they were saying, oh, yes, of course I'm a Christian. And they really don't know what it is to be a Christian at all. But my point is this. We hear all these stats about students, young people who you know, head off to college and then they leave the church. That's been happening for a long, long time. That's not to say they don't come back because many of them come to own their faith finally in college. But listen, here's the point. If the Word of God is not central to your life, and if you're not in the Word regularly and in the body, you know, interpreting and understanding the Bible in our connect groups, in our crew groups with our students on Wednesday nights, in connect groups on Sunday mornings, if you're not in the Word, even on a daily basis, and young people developing a habit of being in His Word, then you're going to go find yourself off in this, this flood of secular thought and ideology that comes at us, and your hand-me-down faith, your second-hand faith, will not, will not prevail. And no wonder so many are turning away, because we claim to believe the Bible, and we don't read it. So I challenge you, honestly, do you read the Bible? And if you don't, this, uh, this whole series is for you. The reason we don't is that perhaps we don't truly believe that it is the Word of God. You know, there was a time in Western civilization, you think about post-Reformation, where it was all about sola scriptura. Scripture alone is our authority. Not, not some structure of hierarchy or some pope or person, but Scripture alone points us to the truth of God. It's one of the five solos of the Reformation. So following the Reformation, all of, of the Western civilization, okay, so, so all through Europe into North America, us, all right, Australia, all of Western civ became this uh, Bible-based, you know, Bible-believing kind of culture that helped shape the, our entire civilization. We're still a culture that's haunted by biblical truth, whether we know it or not. And I mean, in a good way, haunted. Like, it it's guides so much of what we do, but what's happened over time is that we no longer read the Scriptures. It's not central to our lives. And so our great challenge is to get back to the Word. So there was a time, I remember, I remember a bumper sticker that said, um, God said it, right? The Bible says it. I believe it. That settles it, right? And there's two things wrong with that. The truth is, the Bible says that you interpret it, then you believe it. Whatever your inter interpretation is, that settles it. So we'll talk about that in the, over the next couple of weeks. How do you interpret the Bible? Uh, how about this? The Bible says it, whether you believe it or not, that settles it. And so we're going to understand what it is to look at the Word of God and see how we can overcome now the authority. Think about it. If you take, I was talking to our students yesterday about this, if you take the authority of God's Word out from your life, then who, what becomes your authority? 
Now, we've talked about that as we looked at the book of Genesis. Ultimately, you become your own authority. If there's no authority, so it's anybody, you do you, I do me. The autonomous self has become the authority in our culture, the prevalent, predominant authority. So anything goes, your truth up against mine, your truth is okay with mine, until, whoa, there is some conflict there. We don't actually believe the same thing. What do we do about that? What we need is a much more robust education as to what the the Bible and and an understanding of what the Bible is all about. Now, some of you remember, got my students here in front of me, uh, you you would not have remembered this, but back in the day, you probably heard this, we had the three R's of education, right? The foundational core things that you need to know in elementary school in order to move to the next grade to the next grade. The three R's of education, everybody, you, students, you've heard this, the three R's. Okay, the first one is, anybody? Reading, okay. The next one is writing, and the next one is arithmetic. Evidently, spelling wasn't one of the core <laughs> proclivities or competencies. There's only one of those starts with R. That would be reading. Good. I'm just making sure you all are with me. And today, what I want to do, I want to talk about uh, the three R's of Scripture, okay? So if you're taking notes, uh, you can grab your, your journal or whatever, ever, or whatever you have. I want you to turn to 2 Timothy chapter 3, all right? 2 Timothy 3. This is a pretty well-known passage. We're going to put it in context, but we're going to read 2 Timothy 3, verse 14 uh, through 17, all right? Now, if you don't put Scripture in context, I've already referenced that a little bit, it quickly becomes a a pretext. A pretext is an assumed appearance, okay, that actually hides the real truth underneath it. And so it's important to understand, to honor the context. We'll talk about how do you do that. You don't have to have a seminary degree in order to do that. 2 Timothy chapter 3, beginning with verse 14, Paul is talking to his... um, Gosh, a teenage convert. I love this. He came to Christ when he was about 16 years old, most scholars believe. And he's a young man as Paul is investing in him, pouring into his life. In verse 14, he's been talking about um, how you know, you're, you're going to be challenged and, and, and you, you've got to stay strong. And, and I've been pouring my life into you. But listen, you're going to be persecuted. It's going to be tough. Evil people are going to come at you. And young people, life is going to be hard. But you've been acquainted with these sacred writings. He says in verse 14, But as for you, continue in what you have learned and have firmly believed, knowing from whom you learned it. And for Timothy, it was primarily his grandmother and his mom, which is really cool, and how from childhood you have been acquainted with the sacred writings, which are able to make you wise for salvation through faith in Christ Jesus. We'll talk about that. It's pointing to Christ. All Scripture is breathed out by God. All Scripture is inspired by God and profitable. It's advantageous. It's good. It will help you in these ways. Look, profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, for training in righteousness, that or so that for the purpose of the man or woman of God may be complete. That word's not teleos in the Greek. It's artios, which means mature, not perfect, process, not perfection, progress, not perfection, may be complete, mature, equipped for every good work. All right, now let's unpack this. And if you, again, if you want to take notes, let's, let's go with the three R's. What is the Bible? The first one is the Bible is, is relevant, right? The Bible is relevant. There is so much talk about relevance today. You know, what's relevant? What's the latest? What's the hippest, coolest thing out there? And the Bible has remained relevant from the time it was first written. The oldest Uh, books written 3,000 plus years ago. It speaks to every lifetime, every era, on every part of the planet. It's an amazing book. It's more relevant than today's news feed, where you might get, you know, fake news or false news or who knows what the truth is in all things going on in our world today. The Bible is true. C.S. Lewis is the one in his book called The Four Loves. He said that all that is not eternal is eternally out of date. We're always trying to keep up with the next thing, right? I mean, the, you know, music is going to come and go. If I were to ask you who won the Grammys last, last, well, how about last week? I mean, this is America is the song, right? 
um, that won the Grammy. This, and we're going to forget that, I hope. Uh, I, that song's going to be gone, right? Artists come and go. Art comes and goes. Books come and go. Fads come and go. But the Word of God, it says in Isaiah 40, verse 8, the Word of God stands forever. And it stands forever because it's true. It stands the test of time. But look at what it says here. It says in verse, uh, verse 14, but as for you, so they're saying, hey, Timothy, listen, people believe a lot of different things that come and go. Everything is becoming outdated. But as for you, continue in what you've learned. And young people, stay in it. Continue in what you've learned, even if you've just started this weekend, and have firmly believed. He's saying, you have believed this, Timothy. This is yours. Now, as I, I, as I shared with our, with our students just yesterday, hey, believe, Lord, I believe, but help me with my unbelief. We all struggle with belief. He's saying, you've believed this, and knowing from whom you believed it, you've learned it from reliable people, people who love you. And this is the case here in our church, people who love you and who are reliable and trustworthy are teaching the Word of God in our connect groups and to our students, to our children, to our preschoolers. The Bible will stand forever because it's true. I love what Charles Spurgeon, the great uh, Baptist preacher, said in London in the 1800s. Uh, he said a lot of great things, but he said that the Word of God is like a roaring lion. Maybe you've heard that before. You know, people are trying to defend the Bible all the time, and, and we get locked into all different, you know, nuances of, well, is that true? Did that really happen? And what about this and that? And we get lost in that, and some people turn away from the faith because they want every little thing answered. And, 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 and what Spurgeon said was, you don't have to defend a roaring lion. Think about it. You don't have to stand around a lion and say, y'all back off this lion. We're going to protect him. No, the lion can protect itself. The Bible is the roaring lion. And, and it doesn't just protect it. It will pounce on you, right? It will jump on you. Every now and you read scripture and you get jumped on because it is a powerful, powerful tool in the hand of God as he he shows his relevance in every age, every place, every people group. Now look at 2 Timothy 3, 1 through 5. I want to back up and put this in context. Here's what Paul says. He says, but understand this. In the last days, so last days, listen, that would be now, okay, from the time of Christ until he comes again. Last days, there will come times of difficulty. For people will be lovers of self, okay, see if there's any relevance here at all. Lovers of money, proud, arrogant, abusive, disobedience to parent, disobedient to parents, students, take note of that one, ungrateful, unholy, heartless, unappeasable, slanderous. Does this sound a bit like our nation and, and the news feed? Does this sound like, like politics in our day? Does it sound like the challenges we face? Slanderous, without self-control, brutal, not loving good, treacherous, reckless, swollen with conceit, lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God having the appearance of godliness even at times, seeking to be good without any power to be good, but trying to show that we're good. And then he says, avoid such people. Now there's tension there. We're always to be a witness to people, not run from those who don't love God. But he, this is so relevant. Paul could have wrote, he could have written this today. It, it's exactly where we are today. And then he says, but as for you, continue in what you have learned and have firmly believed. Continue in it because it's true all the time. And so I, I want to encourage this gang. Listen, if you're not in a Bible study group, and I challenge our students, you know, what do you do? What's the next steps? It's one thing to come to a weekend. And parents, listen to me. It's quite another thing to say, we're going to make studying the Word of God a priority in our lives. Well, Jeff, you don't know how busy we are. I mean, we got practice. We got basketball. We got this practice. We got all kinds. We got band. We got... Okay, we've got to decide and work hard to make scriptures and studying the scriptures a priority in our lives. Sunday morning, generally, we don't have something going right about 9.15 when we meet in our connect groups. Now you might say, well, I'm kind of busy Saturday nights. I'm kind of out late. Listen, these students can stay up all night and keep going. I've seen it. I've seen it. But they need to go to sleep on Saturday nights to get here. And parents, you've got to lead the way. We've got students who are coming to our youth ministry, coming regularly, committed. And it saddens me that their parents are not. We've got to lead our children to get into the Word, and we've got to model the way. I've wanted nothing more than for my children to see me. It's not why I'm in the Word, but my kids have grown up seeing Dad in the Word every day. 
Not because I'm a preacher or a Bible geek. I'm a follower of Christ. You, we don't hear from him apart from being in his word. He speaks to us by his spirit. He speaks even as I'm preaching in and out. That the spirit is speaking to your heart, convicting you of sin. But he speaks to us regularly, daily, as we're in his word. We study his word. We get together. We talk about his word. We do it in community. But we've got to set aside time. He says, knowing from whom you learned it. I just want, I want to say this. We've got solid staff, ministers, lay leaders who are teaching the Word of God. I praise God for all of our leaders who are devoting their time and energy to our students every single week. We've got crew groups that are going on in homes on Wednesday nights. We've got to, we've got to be committed. And, and listen, adults, you've got to lead the way. Our, our church is known to read the Scriptures, to study the Scriptures, and to apply it. You've come to a church that believes the Word of God. And we will not stray away from the Word. But why is the Bible so much better? I mean, there's a lot of relevant books out there. There's a relevant magazine. It's a good mag. It's relevant, right? Until next year. And not so much. Why is the Bible so powerful? Here's why. Secondly, here's my next R. The Bible is revelation. This is what sets the Bible apart. All right? Revelation is what God has chosen to reveal to us. How about this? We only know what He's chosen to reveal. I'm thinking eternity is an eternal God revealing more of who himself, who he is to us. Every single day we're like, whoa, he's like that. We didn't know that. I hadn't revealed that. I was waiting on this one, you know, until you got here. Okay. I mean, he's, he, all we know about him is what he's revealed to us. And he's revealed to us through his word who he is and what he's done. You think about it. You heard it earlier in the video. 1,600 years. We're going to talk about this next week. The Bible's an amazing book written by 40 authors. 66 books, really. A collection of books. On three continents, three different language groups, over time, people who wrote from all stages and places of life, and yet the Bible tells one single story. How does that happen? It's Because God inspired the writers all along the way as he revealed himself and the redemptive story that points us ultimately to Jesus. Look at what it says in, in 2 Timothy uh, that chapter 3, verse 15. It says this, and how from childhood you have been acquainted with the sacred writings, which are able to make you wise. Look For what? For this, salvation through faith in Christ Jesus. See, it points us to Jesus. The Bible points us to Christ. Now, I'm going to mess with you just for a moment, and some of you need to really sort this out. The Bible is not the end game. We don't worship the Bible, okay? The Bible is a means to another end. The Bible points us to Jesus Christ. He is our Savior. He's the one who rescues us. We had not been singing all morning about the Bible. We've been singing to our Savior, okay? And we've got to get this right because so many of us, we get tripped up on, on the Bible or this verse or that verse. Our faith is not built on a book. It's built on a person. Think about this. We would not have a Bible if it were not for an event. We have a Bible, the Old Testament, the New Testament, all the way through. We'll talk about this more next week. You got to come back, okay? But here's the deal. The Bible would not be in existence as we have it if it weren't for the resurrection. The resurrection took place. People began to write, eyewitnesses began to write about what they saw. That's why we have the Gospels, okay? Passed on to others. Paul, among others, who encountered Christ himself, the risen Christ, he then starts to write much of the New Testament because people start to meet to worship Jesus, the risen Lord, on Sundays, not Saturdays, shift to the resurrection day. And now we've got writings instructing them on how to worship, how to live, how to follow Jesus. This is why we have the Bible. And then they look back and go, oh my gosh, the entire Old Testament, the prophets, the Torah, of the prophets, the writings, all point, the, the minor prophet, all point to Jesus. It's all one story. That's why we have the Bible. The church was born because of the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And so we, we, we must understand this, but here's why the Bible is so critical. It's not, it, we don't toss it out because Romans 10, 17 says, see, see, it tells us that faith comes through hearing and hearing from the word of God. We know all of this because of scripture. So here it is, the last point I want to make, final R, the Bible is required reading. If you want to follow Jesus every day, you've got to be in his word. 
with all of the lies that are coming into your mind. And you know who lies to, your, to you more than anybody? is yourself. You lie to yourself. You believe what Satan is saying. Demonic forces working in our hearts, working against us, spiritual forces against us. And then we have these disordered desires in our minds. If you don't combat that with the truth of God regularly, you will never follow Jesus. You will never pursue him. But here's what's so cool about the Bible. Why is it the most read book of all time? It's the best-selling book. 100 million Bibles every year are sold. 1.6 billion people on the planet, however, do not have a portion of Scripture in their, in their heart language. And we're going to do something about that. There's more on that to come as we move into Easter. But why do we want everybody to have a Bible? Now, and then you're probably going, well, Jeff, I think you've already told us. I mean, but here, look at this, verse 16. All Scripture is breathed out by God. It's all inspired by Him. We'll talk about that next week. And profitable for, look at this, for teaching, for reproof, for correction, for training in righteousness, that the man of God may be complete, equipped for every good work. Now, I want you to see this. I've got a graphic here that'll help you out. Some of you have seen me teach this before, but it's Scripture's profitable. Okay, if the arrow is the, the path of righteousness, the way we're to live our lives, then, it, then the teaching is what shows us how to get on the path. Right? But then watch this. Then he says there's reproof. Right? This is where it shows us how we've gotten off the path. And then there's correction. Correction in God's Word tells us how to get back on the path. And then training in righteousness shows us how to stay on the path and stop getting off the path with all of the consequences, the damage, and the challenge that comes when we stay uh, in our, on our own path instead of the Word of God. But here's the thing. Stay the course in your reading. Some of you, I know the Bible's an intimidating book. Um, it is overwhelming, in fact. It can be for me. Um, and, and so we've got to stay the course. It's kind of like school. Um, I don't know about you students, but for me, it was math. I just did not like math. Anybody love math? Any of y'all love math? Bless you. Um, so, but a lot of you are like, no, that, or whatever. You know, if you love math, then you're probably something else that you just can't handle. That, my point is this. You don't love all subjects in school. But you've got, to take, you've got to take those subjects. You've got to know something, right? We don't, you know, all of Scripture is inspired by God, but not all Scripture is, is as applicable. I mean, we're in the book of Numbers right now. And we're, you know, we're walking through. I mean, in Leviticus, man, there's a bloody religion. But it just points us again to the once and for all sacrifice of Jesus. And so it, it, you've got to, it's like exercise. You've got to stay at it, right? It's like eating a meal. You've got to keep eating. It's like in the family to have meals together. You know, you may have a meal and go, we just kind of argued the whole time. But you know what? If you do that over time, that'll change the course of your family. It's like being in the Word every single day. I, I read Scripture sometime, and I'll walk away from it going, I'm not sure what. I don't know. Lord, I didn't hear anything. I don't know. Uh, but I'm going to do my best today. That was weird. Okay. Um, uh, you know, I mean, that happens. But if I do that daily... It changes the course of my life over time. And that's what it's done. The same is true with you. Stay at it is my point. Be persevering. The point is that you've got to continue in the Word, but there's a warning here. Don't put the Bible in a box and decide that it's simply a set of rules and laws. If you just want to seek the Bible for information and not formation, you're going to end up prideful and judgmental. That's why many believers are. Well, I know God's word, and you're not following it. And what we need is a lot less of this, and we need a lot more of this. I, I need to, I need to repent. I need to turn my heart to God. I'm the one who needs help. I need the word. But listen, gang, here's the thing about the Bible. Many people approach the Bible wrongly, and we look at it, and we go, wow, uh, we, we need to remember this. Before Genesis, there was God, okay? Now, I like the Bible. Now we know about God. And, and this is where we get off in terms of interpretation. Before the, before the book of Exodus, there was the Exodus, okay? Before the Gospels, there was Jesus. And, and so we, we're not, we don't worship the Bible. We worship Christ. And so we don't need to get locked into all kinds of little nuances and stuff that just derail people. 
when the whole Bible points us to Christ and, and a relationship with Him, we'll talk a lot more about that. My point is this, it's a love letter. It's a love letter, it's an invitation for you to join Him. This is why those who are prideful and, and like, man, I know the Scriptures, I know the Scriptures, I know the Scriptures, and become judgmental and prideful. The Pharisees did the same thing. They knew the Bible better than anybody in here today. And here's what Jesus said to them in John 5. You diligently study the Scriptures because you think that by them you possess eternal life. If you keep the Scripture, you, you know that yeah, I got knowledge. I'm, I'm, I grew up in the Bible. I'm all about the Bible. These are the Scriptures that testify about me. Yet you refuse to come to me to have life. Here's what I've learned. Faith precedes reason. Faith, commitment to Christ, precedes understanding. That's how it works. You receive His Spirit, and you come to understand His Word, and it points us to Jesus. It points us to love. Let me tell you something. Loving like Jesus, that's great theology. Being like Christ, that is dead-on theology. And yet, people want to argue about all different parts of the Bible Listen, if the Bible's not pointing you to Jesus, you've missed the point. John 20, verse 31 says this, but these are written that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son, and that by believing Him, you may have life. That's what he says at the end of his, of his book. He says, this is why we've written this. So you know Jesus. That's the point, the main point. So I'm asking you, have you come to Him? Have you come to Christ? And I want to close our time. We're going to sing a song together here in just a moment to close. I don't want anybody running out. We're going to have a chance to just devote ourselves, the students, one last time, to say, as you face the day, as you face the week, and all the challenges that are in your life right now, and every single one of us here, we get a chance to say yes, yes to him again, okay? So Jesus says to this, come to me, all you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. Isn't that what you need more than anything today is rest? soulful, deep gospel rest in Him. You can live that way, regardless of what comes your way. And so I want to close in prayer, okay? I want us to just bow our heads and close our eyes. And I want to ask you, friends, before we leave this place today and before we sing together to proclaim our faith yet again, have you received Christ? And what I mean by that is not you've said, you prayed a magic prayer, it's not a magic prayer. Do you believe that what His Word says is true? Do you believe that what history points to is true, that Jesus died on the cross for your sin so that you might receive His forgiveness by faith, not by your works, praise Him for that, but by believing what He's done for you? Have you done that? And if not, friend, now, right now is the, is the day. Some of you, you don't let this weekend go past without saying yes to him. Jesus says, come to me. This invitation is not to a pastor, not to a church, it's to Jesus himself who says, come and find grace, find forgiveness, find love that you're looking for from me. And so, Lord, we, we give you our lives. Friend, right now, you can just say, it's Jesus, I give you my life. I believe. I believe. And I follow you. I want to follow you with my life. Thank you for dying on the cross for my sin. There are parents here who need to repent and turn to the Lord. There are adults, you're here today and you need to decide to do something. You need to be in the Word. You need to tell someone, I'm going to start reading the Scriptures daily. Some of you need to join the fellowship of the church. Some of you need to follow in baptism. Proclaim to the world that you belong to Him. So, Lord, we give you our lives, and I pray that we'll never, ever be the same. We thank you for your grace today. In your name we pray. Amen. Thank you for taking time to watch this sermon. If you would like more information about our church or following Jesus, please go to our website, pcbc.org, or contact our church offices. We hope to see you next week at church.